Hello and welcome back my friends, or should I say bonjourno? My name is Sheena Peril, I'm the author of 13 novels, and I also design knitwear patterns, all of which you will find linked down below. As we're getting into the summer season, I thought it would be fun to talk about something that I'm hoping to do more of this year. Excuse me, sir. <laughs> I thought it would be fun to talk about something I'm hoping to do more of this summer. I joined the Society for Creative Anachronism last year, but because of work and my health and a bunch of other things, I just wasn't able to participate as much as I wanted to. This year is shaping up a little bit better in that respect, so I'm working on my costumes and doing a little bit more with that. For those that don't know, I used to be a living history interpreter for a museum back in Ohio. Um, I did that for about five years. I worked mostly in the period from the Civil War through about World War I, but I also worked a little bit in the 1920s and the 1950s. And when I moved to Washington in 2019, I lost that community, and I miss it so much. It's been really hard to find living history groups in this area. Um, there aren't a whole lot of museums near me that have living history interpreters on site, so it's just been a real challenge. The SCA is part crafting, part athletics, part living history, all rolled into one. There are occasionally living history events, like what I would take part in at the museum, but often it's just a bunch of weirdos like me getting together in costume, and those costumes can range from all different periods of history, from ancient Egypt up until the Renaissance. We make food, chat, practice sword work, target shooting, sewing, weaving, playing instruments, dancing, and games from the last 400 years or more. For background, my education included art history and general history con concentrated in the Italian Renaissance from about 1400 through the early 1600s. If you've been following the Eleonora project, which is linked down below, then you know my research has been focused between about 1530 to 1560 for, for the most part, which is when Eleonora de Toledo was alive and Duchess of Florence. I lived in Florence and I got totally immersed in the culture and history, so I have a solid background there. Unfortunately, I was never really able to pick up Italian. <laughs> While I wouldn't call myself fluent by any means, I know just enough French to get myself into trouble, so for my persona, I decided to go with a half French, half Florentine woman from the 1530s, so that way if there are gaps in one set of historical knowledge, I can kind of lean on the other one. So for this reason, I decided to go with someone of a slightly higher status, say a wealthy merchant's wife or daughter um, or lower nobility, which would allow that cross-border movement. A political economic marriage would also explain having a mixed background in this period. I haven't hammered out all the details yet of my character. I don't have a full backstory. But when I'm in garb, I do go by the name Lucrezia, after Lucrezia Medici, one of Eleonora's daughters, and Lucrezia Borgia, because why not? And I maintain that Lucrezia Borgia is not the villain that history has made her out to be, but that is my unpopular history opinion of the day. Now, do you know what happens when you tell an unemployed autistic history nerd who loves to sew that they're going to a historical event, but garb is optional? We sit down and sew an entire costume in 12 hours, a lot of it by hand. That's what we do. The first dress I made was meant to be more generic in terms of period. It's based on a very common style of clothing that was in use from the 1200s up until about 1600, but similar styles continued all the way through the 1700s, just with different underpinnings. I knew I didn't have time for tailoring, so what I'd have are two stiffened trapezoidal shapes, one for the front, one for the back, which lace up along the sides. This way I can adjust the size as needed. My body fluctuates a lot because of my medications, so I wanted to make sure that I was able to wear this no matter what. The skirt is just yardage that I cut down to be the right length from my waist to the floor, hemmed, and I left slits in the side below the bodice lacing so that I could access pockets. 
For that first event, which was a cheese rolling, I only had this dress and a white modern blouse that I wore underneath that kind of mimicked a chemise if you squinted at it really hard. After that event, I started making accessories. The aforementioned pockets, an apron, a pouch to hang from the apron ties, drawers, and a chemise. I know someone out there just heard a record scratch at the mention of drawers. Please remember that I am a chronically ill person who is more familiar with the 1860s costumes. So yes, I know these are not true to the 1530s, at least not the style. However, they make me feel more comfortable and secure in costume, and they prevent chafing. As someone who is very sensitive to heat, this is extremely important. It's also underwear. No one is going to know I'm wearing it unless I say so. I don't go around asking who's going commando or not, so leave the chores alone. Also, some women in the past did wear them, and there is a record of a pair in Eleonora de Toledo's uh, wardrobe inventory. The chemise is based on another historical pattern that is all rectangles and triangles. I used a black bamboo bed sheet for this, and I should mention that everything for this outfit came from my stash except for the lacing, which I had to pick up later. The day of the event, I just used satin ribbon because it was what I had on hand. Black would be extremely uncommon for a chemise, but here's the thing. My goth little heart did not want a white chemise for this dress, or for the second one I was already plotting in my head. White would just look funny. This outfit is black and blue. The chemise needed to match. So I cut up an unused flat sheet and made myself a quick and dirty camicha or chemise, and I still have some leftover fabric from that that I can use later. The thing I like about this fabric is that even though it's black, it's very comfortable and cooling. See above where I mentioned heat sensitivity. It's also a very soft, smooth fabric, so it doesn't get hung up on my skirt or my drawers when I walk. So that was my first costume, and it's great. It's a cool, casual outfit that I can wear all year long with the addition or removal of layers. It has tons of pockets, so I don't need a purse or a basket. It fits, it's adjustable, it's great. But why stop there? Go big or go home, right? I started on dress number two at the end of April, and I'm calling this one the Catherine de' Medici dress, but I don't think it's inspired by one of her portraits. It's more inspired by her as a person. Known for wearing black in the style of the Spanish court, Catherine was a contemporary of Eleonora. Her style was very French since she was married to and mother of the French king, several of them, in fact. Um, so for the shape of this gown, I took a very common style from the period, which is similar to the first dress I made, but it has side back lacing and a very distinct back shape and trim pattern. I think this is best illustrated in the red Eleonora gown, which we think either belonged to her and was then passed on to a lady-in-waiting when she died, or it was made for the lady-in-waiting by Eleonora's tailor using her preferred pattern. You can see the distinct V pattern made by the trim on the bodice and the trapezoid shape of that back piece. It's a much sharper angle than on my blue dress. This dress is very hard to put on by yourself, so it's definitely an upper-class piece. This whole project was inspired by this fleur-de-lis fabric that I had in my stash. It's been there for years and I hadn't figured out what to do with it. I have two remnants of this material, so not enough for the full gown. I'm going to use part of it for like a stomacher or that V-shape on the front, and then I'll use it for another triangular panel at the front of the skirt. Any offcuts I'll use for trim on the sleeves. The bodice is a low pile synthetic velvet that I found at the thrift store, and the skirt and sleeves will be made of a synthetic lightweight dupioni that I've picked up at a discount fabric store. I didn't film the start of this dress because I honestly wasn't sure what I was doing would actually work. I self-drafted the pattern using the things I learned from the blue dress. Normally, this type of gown would be stiffened with buckram, which is linen dipped in hide glue. I didn't have linen or buckram or hide glue, and the modern substitute is to use PVA, but I was not about to go dipping my fabric in Elmer's glue. 
Uh, for starters, just the thought of that texture makes me shudder. And for another, we just didn't have any of that either. I also really didn't want to cover my entire front in plastic when I've already had to compromise by using synthetic fabrics. The bodice is fully lined in cotton muslin, and I wanted to give this as much of a chance to breathe as possible. I did have an entire roll of lightweight boning, however, and I have more experience with corsets than I do with 16th century fabric stiffening. So I used ribbons and bias tape to make boning channels on the lining only. I've been learning recently that the key to good historical costumes comes down to two things for me. For me, anyway. Ironing and basting. Anytime I make a fold in a natural fiber, I iron it. I didn't iron the synthetics just because they have such a low heat tolerance, but making sure they fit to the cotton lining once it was ironed did go a long way. The second thing is basting. I'll be honest, I hate pins and quilt clips just aren't good for everything, so I did a ton of basting on this bodice and it saved me a lot of time later on. I'm just using an overcast stitch to fasten the lining to the outer shell. For this part, I did have to use pins, but I kept it to just a few at a time. And that is where I am with my second costume. I know it doesn't look like much right now. My next step is adding the trim and additions to the bodice and placing the shoulder straps. If you've been here a while, you know that I don't typically use patterns because I have very narrow shoulders and a large bust. So the adjustments I have to do to make commercial patterns work for me are often so extreme that it's just easier to start from scratch. Next time, we'll take a look at the construction of the skirt and sleeves and how I'm trimming it out. Other things I want to make in the future include a partlet, veil, some jewelry, and stockings, but that's another video. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, or leave any comments or questions down below. In the description, you'll find links to all of my socials, my Kofi, and my books. My books and Kofi are really keeping me going right now, so I would appreciate it if you check those out. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope that you have something soft and fluffy to cuddle with. Ciao!